from uh, a version called the New Century Version of the Bible. It's 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2. The Father has loved us so much that we are called the children of God. And we really are his children. The reason the people in this world don't know us is they've not known him. Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and we have not yet been shown what it will be like in the future, but we know in whom Christ is, and we know when he comes we will be like him because we see him, we will see him then as he really is. Let's begin with just a quick prayer, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be accepting in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. This morning, our lesson is going to be about family. The common denominator equals the blood. Now, over the Easter season, I was studying Max Lucada's particular devotional, which I only brought part of my, my uh, wonderful things that I have from him. But um, and it was, it's called In the Footsteps of the Savior. Some of you may have already read it or, or have done this Bible study for it because it's not like it's brand new this time, but it's something that I was really intrigued with. And thank you. <laughs> and as part of this study, he wrote about families. And after listening and learning with him one morning, my mind began to think about things. And I'm a great wanderer, so you have to be a little careful where it goes sometimes. I wondered, how many families do you think have been born onto this earth since the beginning of time? I would not want to buy school clothes for all of those families. How many families have a color that dominates particular eyes? So let's just for fun. How many here have blue eyes? Put your hand up. Not one of these hands. This hand so I can, we're not counting, we're just looking. How many of you have brown eyes? Ooh, okay, we're about 50-50. We're about How many of you have green eyes? Oh, I like it. <laughs> so many, or some, not so many, have families with freckles. Or they have families with curly hair. And how about relationships in families? Sometimes, how crazy do families make us feel? Well, today the internet takes the place of what we used to do. The internet has a, something called, many different places, called Ancestry.com if we want to look into a genealogy. It also has MyHeritage.com and MyGenealogyBank.com. These are just a few of many that are listed in the internet. However, before the internet, we used to talk to family members about who might remember about our family's history. We spent time with our grandparents, our aunts, our uncles, our cousins, who all told us stories about our family. And they would give us information as far back as their memories would go. And sometimes then they would give us names of somebody that we may not have heard of, but it was somebody who would know about the history of your family. So go talk to them and see where Grand Aunt Ethel went and how, she, how she's related to this, this, and that. And you know, it's kind of fun to go back to all these things. Many of us today that are present here have been blessed to have a family that we know and they know, have known us since the day of our birth. We know where we fit in in order of birth, how many siblings we have, do we or don't we get along with family members, whether they're close or extended. Well, Max's study was, of course, talking about biblical families. And he wrote, and I agree, that when it comes to reading those long passages of genealogy about this person who begat this person who begat this person and on and on and on and on and on, it didn't really make for what we would call good journalism or be interesting because the names for the most part were nothing that we would have had today as a name. So I asked myself, do you suppose this really makes for a good sale? Well, I could not help it. I looked up this fun fact. The Bible, and this is so sweet, they could only go back 50 years, so have patience with them. They're young. The Bible has far outsold any book written with a whopping 3.9 billion, with a B, 
coffee sold over the last 50 years. As I say to you, they only went back 50 years. You know the Bible's a lot older than that. In this top-selling book, God shows us that the family is very important. In fact, the genealogies in this Bible are so important, they were memorized and passed down from generation to generation by word of mouth. These genealogies were repeated like you and I would have learned uh, the table of multiplication. And you went over it and over it until your mother and your brother and your sisters and everybody said, please stop asking me to listen. Because that was important, not only to them, but to God. God has arranged the genealogies in the Bible in this manner to show us two things. First thing, his point of view, the importance of family or genealogy, and the second is how the blood is our connection. The first book of the Bible bears the English title Genesis, which comes from the Greek word. Now you have to give me a second here. Kenesios. That's as much Greek as I know. And for those of you who are big spellers, it's spelled G-E-N-E-S-E-O <laughs> hyphen above it S. <laughs> and that means beginning or generations. In Genesis 1, we're shown evidence that both God and the Holy Spirit were written down for the first of many times in our Bible. In Genesis 1.26, we find evidence of Jesus. That verse reads, and then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Now, most Bible scholars recognize that this is a reference to the triune God, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we read Genesis, we see that God the head was not, not only, was creating not only the earth, but also the very first family. That was who class? I don't hear you. Adam. Yes! I had this terrible urge to do my first grade joke, but I thought I won't, you know, Adam and Eve and pinch me went swimming, Adam and Eve drowned, who was left? But I won't do that. Can you imagine what it looked like on the first day with the first family? A perfect world. God the Father was joyful about all he had seen from his creation. Adam and Eve and the earth. And we know this because it is written multiple times in Genesis that his comment was, and it was good. But God wanted man and women to grow in wisdom and in knowledge of him. So he gave them a new gift the gift of the freedom of choice. Now that came with just one warning for them not to eat from one tree. One tree, an entire perfect world. Strawberries or cucumbers or whatever your favorite is, as far as the eye could see. Perfect, just don't eat from the one tree. Enter the evil one, full of deceit and lies. Freedom of choice, deceit and lies meet head on and the outcome was the first family got ejected because of their bad choice from the perfect garden forever. We might even say that the outcome for Adam and Eve's family was literally murder because one son killed the other after they were out of the garden in Eden. There was bad blood, heartache, and a family left in tatters. Yes, they struggled, but neither the family nor the generations to follow would be the same. Okay, let's look further in the Old Testament to Genesis 35. Here we find the story of Joseph, the second youngest of 12 brothers born to Israel, or Jacob. Now, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because Joseph had been born to Jacob in his old age. To show his love, and bad idea, favoritism, Jacob had a very ornate robe made for Jesus. Imagine how that affected the family dynamics. When his brothers saw that his father loved Joseph more than any of them, they were jealous and they hated that kid. The same passage also mentions two dreams Joseph had. In the dreams, he indicated that his brothers would someday bow to him. Oh, this only fueled the brothers' hatred. A plan, that made, a plan was made to catch hold of Joseph and throw him into a dry well, just leave him there till he died by his brothers. Nice family. 
So the following day, after they had done just that, thrown him into the well, the brothers saw a traveling caravan of Ishmaelites. They had a chance to make some money, so they sold him into slavery. They took Joseph's multicolored coat, they smeared it with blood, and they told their father that they had found it, that an animal must have killed Joseph. We see these people who are related by blood using blood to cover the dirty deed. And meanwhile, Joseph was taken to Egypt. He was sold to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guards. God had just given Joseph the dreams, and he continued to bless him throughout his life. This enabled Joseph to find favor with Potiphar, and when Joseph ended up in a prison for a crime he did not commit, God's presence continued to be with him. He interpreted dreams of two prisoners and eventually the Pharaoh of Egypt. Now Pharaoh recognized God's given ability in Joseph and gave him the second highest position of authority in all of Egypt. Can you imagine some renegade not even born in Egypt? Now he's second in command? I can only imagine that did not make him real popular at first either. Years of shortage of food in Canaan forces, forces uh, Jacob, the father, Joseph's father, to send his sons to buy some grains from the Egyptians. And about 20 years at this point has passed. Joseph finally encounters his brothers again. They don't recognize him, and he deliberately conceals his identity. He accuses them of being spies and tells them to return with his newly discovered baby brother, Benjamin. Otherwise, he's not selling them grain. The ongoing famine, famine forces Jacob to reluctantly send his sons back to Egypt with baby brother Benjamin, who wasn't really a baby by then. Joseph then tests the character of his brothers by placing his, his own silver cup into the sack of baby Benjamin. And as they leave, he realizes it's missing, and he falsely, falsely accuses them of stealing. And when they find it in Benjamin's sack, that guy's going to jail. When Judah, the brother who negotiated Joseph's sale as a slave, offers to stay in place of baby Benjamin, Joseph sees that Judah's character has now changed. Joseph then reveals himself as a brother. In Genesis 50, 20, Joseph exclaimed, What you intended for harm to me, God intended for good. Jacob is an entire family, reunites with Joseph in Egypt, and the bad blood is, was changed by God and continued the genealogy in the Bible. Now let's jump to the book of Joshua, chapters 2 and 6. We meet Rahab. Now she's running a brothel in Jericho when the advance party of a eh, two million Israelites come barreling down toward town and two spies who take up lodging in her inn. She has heard about how God has made the Israelites victorious over their enemies, and she knew that the city of Jericho was the next for the enemy, next enemy to be defeated. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people of her city who refused to obey God. The last thing one would have expected was for God to go out of his way to save a pagan prostitute in a city that was about to be utterly decimated because of its sin. But Rahab was graciously grafted into the family of Christ. Her ability to change her ways has encouraged countless generations to seek divine mercy and pardon for their lives and their actions. Yes, God hates sin, but God loves people. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. And while we see that an indescribable amount of blood was shed in this story, we also see that faith in the living God, we can have, with, through faith in the living God, we can, have, we can have, be a member of God's genealogical family in the Bible. Now let's follow the timeline from Old Testament over to New and look at the book of Matthew. Matthew, if you remember right, was the tax collector turned apostle, thanks to Jesus. 
Tax collectors were hated in those days because they were Jewish in general. They worked for the Romans, extracting taxes and then some from the people. But Matthew came to know the Lord through Jesus. In Matthew's genealogy, he declares that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, raised by Joseph, who worked as a carpenter in Nazareth, was the descendant of Abraham through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Matthew goes out of his way to convince his reader, particular his readers that would be Jewish, that Jesus, who had no home, no fortune, and only a kind of unimpressive group of believers, was the royal king in the line of David, whose kingdom would never end. Matthew witnessed that God has always intended for God's blessing, his promises, his rule to be the pe- rule to be for people from every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation, not exclusively those who had pure Jewish blood running through their veins. He wanted to make clear that being a part of God's flam- family has never been about blood, but it's always been about faith. We've recently celebrated Easter, and I see that. These are just beautiful. We can say that we believe, and we have read the events written in our Bible, that Jesus did indeed shed his precious blood for our sins. But we also need to remember that when Jesus became God and a human man, that he came from a long line of outsiders, and outlaws, and scoundrels, and sinners. And when he entered into the world, he entered into the messiness of a human family, even his very own family. In fact, he was the only member of our human family who never brought shame to his th- to the family, nor to, to his father, Father God. Instead, he took it upon himself, all of our sins. Now, it may surprise you to know that Jesus had a difficult family, that he had brothers and sisters. Mark 6, 3 gives us Jesus' family unit, their names. It says, Jesus was just the carpenter, son of Mary and the brother of James, Judas, not the bad guy, and Simon. And his sisters were there too, on behalf of all sisters. (laughs) Matthew, that was just mean. Okay, or when the hometown boy who had done well and referred to himself as Messiah, the one to fulfill prophecy. Mark 3.21 shows the family's lack of support because it reads, his family went to get him because they thought he was out of his mind. As Max Licata states in his book, it's worth noting that he, meaning Jesus, didn't try to control his family's behavior, nor did he allow his family's behavior to control him. In the end, one brother becomes an apostle, and you'll find that in Galatians 1.19, and others become missionaries. God still changes families. A difficult family member could end up being your very precious nearest relative. Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15 tell us that God has named every family in heaven and earth and that he has given us good instructions for loving the people he assigned to each of us. One of the greatest gifts we give our family is the knowledge of God's word. In Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 and 7, it reads, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Always remember these commandments I give you. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home. That counts if you're working on your computer or if you're working on your iPad. It counts because he wants you to talk to your family, not just have family. And when you walk along the road, hardly ever do we get out and have nice walks. And a thousand years ago when I was a kid, we used to go for long drives, but gasoline was fairly inexpensive then. But when your time is precious and you're together with your families, talk with them. Give them your thoughts from God when you lie down and when you get up. When we follow these instructions laid out in these Bible verses about family, we'll find that families can be a source of great blessing. 
Some today have not had these exact same experiences. Not everybody was born into their family. Some of you may know those or be yourself adopted into a family. But you were chosen by that family. That family loves you. God loves you even more. In the following verses, we are reminded that God is what God has done for all of us. In Matthew 6, 25 through 34, it reminds us that God has provided for all our needs. In Psalms 139, 5, it reminds us that God has protected us from harm. When I, when I read that, I thought, I always put my seatbelt on, but I suppose there's been that one time. And the kids watch. Hey, Dad never wears his seatbelt. Why do I have to wear it? You know, you get that kind of flack. They're watching. In 1 John 3, 1, it tells us that God has given us his name. In Ephesians 1, 5, it says that God has adopted us. That makes you, that makes me, a child of the king. Right now, take a moment and just look around this place. Seriously, look around and see who's here. It's okay to turn backwards. Nobody's going to take any pictures of the back of your head. Go ahead. Look behind you. Who's behind you? Who's beside you? What's going on? Are they asleep? Nudge them a little bit. Okay. Those who have asked to be forgiven of their sins and invited Jesus to be our Savior are the children of God. Wow. We have royalty everywhere here this morning. I hope that we have learned something from seeing God's vision of families and that we do realize that the common denominator actually is the blood, that that blood is the blood of Jesus. If I may leave you with one challenge for the rest of the week, go out and show others your vision of Jesus. And if you have to, use words. God bless you. Thank you for letting us share our worship service with you today. We invite you to join us in person next Sunday at 1030, or if you prefer, to listen online Sunday afternoon. If you would like to make a donation, please visit our website at www.marionpress.org and click the Donate Now button. May God bless you and have a great week.